المواطنون الأحرار إنه عهد الحرية والكرامة والعزة بالنسبة للفرد وهو بالنسبة للمجتمع A stirring TV address from the 1970s The audience is the people of Yemen and the speaker is the president of the Yemen Arab Republic. His message is one of unity. How a country divided can heal its differences and move forward. كمطلب شعبي لأبناء اليمن في الشطرين وكهدف أساسي من أهداف ثورة السادس والعشرين من سبتمبر وثورة الرابع عشر. The president's ambition would be fulfilled within a few years. However, brutal events at a banquet would end up reshaping the course of Yemen's history. إنه في هذا اليوم الأسود الكئيب في تاريخ شعبنا اليمني العظيم. صدت أيد آثمة مجرمة خائنة لشعبها ووطنها على حياة قائد مسيرتنا الأخ المناضل المقدم إبراهيم محمد الحمدي This is the story of a murder an assassination that took place over 40 years ago. The killing occurred in the Yemeni city of Sana'a, and the victim was none other than the country's president, Ibrahim al-Hamdi. It's a murder that still resonates today in a nation that is still deeply divided and at odds with its neighbors. In this film, Jamal al molike from Al Jazeera Arabic will reveal a chain of events that is in every sense stranger than fiction. A timeline to the political assassination of President Ibrahim al-Hamdi, a killing that took place on an October day in 1977. Even though al-Hamdi was assassinated over four decades ago, Recent protests have evoked the memory of the dead leader. Here in 2011, protesters against Yemeni President Ali Abdullah Saleh hark back to times past. محاولة علي عبد المصالح لمحو هذه الذكريات ترافق دائما مع تكريس سياسات خاصة بالنظام بمعنى أن مثلا محاولة تحويل الجيش إلى عائلة. ترافق دائما مع محو ذكرى الحمدي الذي حاول أن يبني مؤسسة عسكرية محترمة وبالتالي ما حصل في وعي المجتمع هو رؤية هذا الطباط حتى بصورة عفوية وبالتالي لمقاومة هذه الممارسات التي يقوم بها النظام عليك أن تستحضر ذكرى نقيضة وهو نظام الحمدي حمدي defined what it meant to be a Yemeni because there's an entire generation of Yemenis who's looking for their Hamdi their Hamdi who defined what it meant to be a Yemeni, who defined with the Yemeni state, and everyone is looking for that today. And we ask, where is our Hamdi? What set Al Hamdi apart from leaders before and after him was that he bore the personal charisma of a reformer and a modernist. His country, North Yemen, was divided from its neighbor in the south. Authority lay not in the hands of central government, but with a number of powerful tribes. Al Hamdi saw himself as a force that could unite a divided country. وروح التسامح هذه الخلطة العجيبة في شخصيته تجسدت بسلوكياته في يومه مع الناس من خلال تكريمه لبعض الوسطاء لبعض الموظفين الصغار الذين يحترمون عملهم. While Yemen has never been as prosperous as its Gulf neighbors. 
it does occupy an important strategic position at the mouth of the Red Sea. Historically, Yemen had been ruled by and divided between the Ottoman and British empires. The North declared independence in 1962 and the South in 1967. Three years later, South Yemen would become the only Marxist country in the region, allying itself with the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, Ibrahim al-Hamdi was becoming a rising star of Yemeni politics. In 1972, he was transferred from a mid-ranking military role to become Deputy Prime Minister and, later that same year, Deputy Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. Two years later, al-Hamdi emerged as the figurehead of the self-proclaimed Corrective Movement, a manifesto for an imminent coup d'etat. Al-Hamdi, when he came to the government, he was the Prime Minister of the Army. كانت مراكز القوى تعتقد بأنها تستطيع أن تسحب البساط وأنها سوف تغير مواقع رجال الحمدي في القوات المسلحة ما كانت تعلم بأن الحمدي قد بدر البذور الأولى لحركة التصحيح On the 13th of June 1974, Hamdi made his move. This British embassy cable from the North Yemen capital Sana'a reported the resignation of the then president Al Iryani. There were other high profile resignations on that day, clearing the decks for the arrival of a new president. The transition was bloodless, and for the first time, a modernizer was at the helm of the Yemen Arab Republic. <laughs> إبراهيم الحمدي وأجاد إخراجها يعني وصل البلد إلى حالة من الفوضى السعودية اللي حاولت تقدم الدعم دعمت مراكز قوة لم تقدم معونة لليمن على الإطلاق وإنما لتكوين مراكز قوة داخل اليمن نبقى في في صراعات وجد الوضع وإبراهيم الحمدي وصل إلى نائب رئيس الوزراء إنه ما فيش ما في سلطة للدولة it was 1974, and President Al-Hamdi's victory celebrations were short-lived. His first priority was to build confidence with neighboring Saudi Arabia, a country that was bigger, more powerful, and far wealthier than impoverished North Yemen. Hamdi's first official visit was to the Saudi capital, Riyadh, aiming to maintain good relations, yet reduce dependence on Saudi Arabia who wielded considerable influence over Yemen's powerful tribes. As the incoming president, Al-Hamdi was walking a tightrope. His instinct as a modernizer was to bring the reins of power into the capital, but that meant wrestling control from the tribes who had traditionally run Yemen. One of Hamdi's attempts was to create a uh, modern armed force that would not be organized tribally, but would be composed of units that were of mixed personnel that would therefore be loyal to the hierarchical chain of command rather than the particular sheikhs. صحيح كان هناك قيادة قبل 27 ابريل وقبل 13 يونيو وكان هناك رئاسة أركان ولكن أنا أستطيع أن أقول بأن القيادة ورئاسة أركان كانت لا تستطيع أن تصيدر الصيدرة الحقيقية على كل مجريات الأمور داخل القوات أو الوحدات في القوات المسلحة. وبحمد الله. On the 27th of April 1975, President Al Hamdi issued a decree which effectively centralized control of the army. No longer would tribes wield great influence over the military. The new power brokers would be Al Hamdi and army officers loyal to the new president. باعتبرنا مجله متخصصه شويه عسكريه بنسال سيادتك بنرجو القاء الضوء على قرارات 27 ابريل الخاصه بتنظيم القوات المسلحه وتطورها والتي لمسناها خلال زيارتنا لوحدات القوات المسلحه المختلفه. وجود ما نقول عليه مراكز قوى خارج القوات المسلحه كتسحب نفسه على وجود مثل هذه داخل القوات المسلحه فانا استطيع ان اقول ان اهم ما استهدفته قرارات 27 ابريل هو توحيد توحيد القوات المسلحه اي بمعنى ادق 
بأن تصبح القوات المسلحة منضبطة لقيادة واحدة شكلا وجوهرا. Yemen in the 1970s was desperately poor and kept afloat by foreign aid. Al Hamdi believed that this dependence on aid fundamentally weakened both parts of Yemen. He formulated a five year development plan harnessing local cooperatives. Their goal to economically place Yemen on its own two feet. When Ibrahim al Hamdi came to power in 1974 as a charismatic figure, a populist with a clear political uh, plan, he knew that in order to bring about the kind of changes that he wanted to see in the country, that it was necessary to strengthen government institutions. And I think his vision was to build upon the success of these local cooperative associations. He was certainly the first one to express a vision of using the cooperatives as a national organization and in a way build up uh, a national political base um, from the cooperative movement. <laughs> وإن من أهم ما حددته حركة الثالث عشر من يونيو التصحيحية هو الخروج بهيئات التعاون الأهلي للتضوير من دوائرها المتعددة الضيقة إلى دائرة واحدة واسعة وذلك بانضواء تلك الهيئات التعاونية تحت لواء واحد هو لواء الاتحاد العام وربط مشاريعها القائمة على المبادرات الشعبية في مختلف المجالات بخطة الدولة الإنمائية بدون تفريق بين الريف والمدينة في الخدمات الصحية والتعليمية وشق الطرقات وتوفير مياه الشرب حركة التعاونية الأهلية للتطوير والتي لعبت دور مهم جدا في في تطوير المجتمع بالذات في الأرياف كانت تسابق الدولة في الحقيقة يعني في بناء مدارس بجهود شعبية طبعا بعدين خصصوا لها من الزكاة نسبة معينة وكانت تقوم بدور هذا كان زعمها Ibrahim al-Hamdi. Beyond the borders of North Yemen, al-Hamdi continued to develop international relations, including with the Soviet Union, who had close ties with neighboring South Yemen. In March 1977, regional security topped the agenda at a Red Sea summit meeting in the Yemeni city of Taiz. It's been claimed that at the Taiz summit, there were rumblings of an assassination plot against al-Hamdi. كنت يومها ممثلا أيضا لصحيفة القبس الكويتية وكنت الصحفي غير اليمني الوحيد الذي غطى تلك القمة وكانت قمة غاية في الأهمية وأهم أهميتها هو هي أنها كانت سببا إضافيا حفز خصوم رئيس الحمدي على أن يقتله ويتخلصوا من نظامه بالنسبة لمؤتمر تعز اللي عقد لقمة البحر الأحمر كان معروف ان في اتصالات جاريه بالفعل لعقد مؤتمر قمه اخر. ده سؤال الشطر الثاني منه ماذا تم حتى الان بالنسبه لامن البحر الاحمر؟ البحر الاحمر هو من الناحيه العمليه يهم بالدرجه الاولى الدول المطله على البحر الاحمر. وعلى الاخوه القادرين في البلاد العربيه ان يشعروا بمسؤوليتهم في مساعده هذه الدول على وجود الامكانيات المتطورة التي تساعد على وجود ضمانات أكيدة لهذا الدفاع الغضب السعودي من قمة تعز يتلخص في اعتقاد خاطئ لدى السعوديين في حينه السعوديون اعتقدوا أن هذه الدول التي يرتبط أغلبها بعلاقات جيدة جدا مع الاتحاد السوفيتي يمكن أن تمثل تهديدا لأمن الإقليم وليس الحفاظ على أمن الإقليم Around the same time, Al-Hamdi met his southern counterpart, President Salam Rabia Ali, in a town straddling the north-south border. They committed to improving relations and to begin steps to unify Yemen into a single country. Both leaders agreed to sit down again nine months later in the southern city of Aden. The stage was set for the first visit by a North Yemeni leader to the Marxist regime in the south. Al-Hamdi, however, would not live to keep this appointment. توصل سالمين وتوصل الحمدي إلى اتفاق بأن يتم إعلان خطوات وحدوية في 
اثناء زيارته زياره الحمدي الى عدن للحضور الاحتفالات بمناسبه ذكرى ثوره 14 اكتوبر كان قد سبق ان تم الاتفاق على توحيد المناهج وفي تقديرنا ان الطريقه الواحده ليس بالدم ابدا انما بالتفاهم وبالتكامل وبالمصلحه المشتركه و الخطوات التي تمت واهمها على سبيل المثال للحظ هو توحيد الكتاب المدرسي للتاريخ اليمني قبل الاسلام وبعد الاسلام والذي قام بتاليفه لجنه مشتركه من اخواننا في الشطر الجنوبي من الوطن ومن الشطر الشمالي والذي يطبع الان وسيتم تدريسه في كل انحاء اليمن الواحد كان هناك اتفاق على تحيل التمثيل الدبلوماسي كان هذه الخطوات سوف تعلن في اثناء الزياره توحيد التمثيل الدبلوماسي وقد بدات كانت تنفذ بشكل عملي يعني في بعض يعني رمزي محدود عنصريات الى اخره وكان هناك توجه الى توحيد العلم والنشيد سوف يتم الاعلان عن هذا يعني كانت خطوات معبره جدا في زياره عدن سيعلن عن توحيد العمله وان تكون دينار توحيد العلم ان يكون علم الجنوب وبنجمه زرقاء نجمه خضراء يعني بدل النجمه الحمراء في المثلث نجمه خضراء ان تكون العاصمه صنعاء Under the stewardship of Al-Hamdi, Yemen appeared to be on a fast track to unification. While his supporters welcomed the idea, some domestic opponents and their more powerful neighbor viewed the prospect with less enthusiasm. The Saudi role in Yemen has always been complex, has always been complicating. The Saudis did not like Hamdi in the end, toward the end. They saw him as independent, of them, of course. They saw him as perhaps threatening because he was able to consolidate the country behind him, a very difficult thing to do in Yemen. And he also had a particular international efforts to try and, well, the relationship with the South Yemen. And the Saudis would be very uh, anxious if there were any moves to unify the country. <laughs> أنه كل ما اقترب من مشروع الدولة الوطنية اليمنية الحديثة ومن مشروع الوحدة اليمنية كل ما وجد نفسه يبتعد عن السعودية لأن من يريد أن يقترب من السعودية يجب أن يشيل كرئيس كرئيس أقصد كرئيس أو كحاكم يجب أن يشيل من ذهنه فكرة بناء الدولة الوطنية الحديثة Not wanting to risk alienating the country's neighbor, President Al-Hamdi flew to Saudi Arabia. His aim, to reassure the Saudis that his desire was to forge a new relationship, one that looked to a shared and prosperous future. According to President Al-Hamdi's spokesman, who accompanied the leader, the visit ended prematurely. <laughs> وشرح لنا قال له نحن في الحقيقه ظلينا حريصين باستمرار على ان تكون علاقتنا بالسعوديه باعتبارها دوله شقيقه وقاره تكون على ارقى المستويات علاقات جوار وعلاقه احترام متبادل ولانه نحن نشوف انه مصيرنا واحد ولكن يبدو ان الاخوه في المملكه يعني لا يتعاملوا بهذه النظره وانما يروا بانه اليمن لا تستحق ان تكون دوله وانما ولا الرئيس حتى اللي يمثلها كانه رئيس نحن كل شيء ممكن ان نقبله الا ان تمس كرامتنا الوطنيه يشتون الرسم الحدود بالطريقه اللي يشتوها نحن نرى بانه مساله الحدود ليس وقته الان تقاطعت الطرق بين الرئيس شهيد ابراهيم الحمدي وبين المملكة العربية السعودية تقاطعت المصالح لأنه بالتأكيد في خطوط حمراء أمام السعودية أمام أي حاكم يمني فالسعودية كانت تتحكم بتحديد من يكون رئيس الوزراء السعودية في رسالة رسمية بتوقيع كمال أدهم وبخطاب من المملكة إلى رئيس الدولة حينها بضرورة تغيير 
رئيس الوزراء محسن العيني وتحديد الاسم الذي يأتي بداله بالقاضي عبد الله الحجري. Meanwhile, back in North Yemen, loyal associates warned Al Hamdi that he was over reliant on untrustworthy military leaders, notably his army commander Ahmed Al Hashmi. باقترابنا من من الحمدي يعني تبين أو من قيادة الحركة بشكل عام تبين أن هناك جناح رابع يدعي القربة من جناح الحمدي وكان يضم أحمد حسين الغشمي رئيس الأركان ويضم حمد الخميس في الأمن ويضم عبد الله صالح قائد له تعز هذا الجناح الرابع كان مثابة حسان طروادة الذي من خلاله تم اختراق حركة 13 يونيو وتصفية قيادتها الوطنية الوحدوية. The Saudis then resorted to their most favorite and most uh, tried and true. I would hate to say true, it wasn't, but uh, which is to pay off, give money to those tribes that they thought would support them. And what it meant was create problems for the central government, in this case Hamdi. To try to keep him from becoming too strong, and I think in the end they just decided he was a threat and decided to remove him. سفير الجمهور العربي اليمنية في القاهرة حسن السعودي كان عنده عند حسن السعودي بلا يعني معرفة بما بيدور قبل اختيار إبراهيم الحمدي في سبعة وثمانية عشر. وقال لي أقول له هذه الصورة وهذا لأول مرة أقولها لم أقولها من قبل قال لي يجب أن يتخلص من أحمد الغشمي هناك بوادر إنه لقاءات مع أحمد الغشمي بقيادات سعودية وقيادات يمنية بتصفيات إبراهيم الحمدي وكان علي عبد الله صالح متعامر مع أحمد الغشمي وكان من أقرب الناس علي عبد الله صالح لأحمد الغشمي كلمت وصلته ونقلت الأمانة للرئيس الشهيد إبراهيم الحمدي أثناء وصولي من القاهرة مباشرة. President Al Hamdi, however, dismissed suggestions that the army commander Al Hashmi was plotting against him. He argued quite the opposite: that Al Hashmi had been consistently loyal to him throughout his presidency. قادة الأحزاب كانوا يطرحوا رأي لإبراهيم الحمدي إنه هناك معلومات عندنا متواترة أنه هناك محاولة للاغتيال بيتبناها الغشمي ولكن الشهيد إبراهيم الحمدي في الحقيقة كان يرفض هذا الفكرة نهائيا قال ثقتي بالأخ أحمد تماما كثقتي بعبد الله الحمدي هكذا عمل أصبعي فشيلوا من ذهنكم هذا الكلام أذكر عندما سافر إلى فرنسا وعقد صفقة المواصلة الحديثة في اليمن اخترعوا معركة في أرحب يعني أنه كانوا يهجموا على صنعاء وأن أحمد القشمي سط هذه الهجوم ووثق علاقته في إبراهيم الحمدي ولكن أنه هذا أحمد القشمي هو الذي سيقف ضد هذه القواء التقليدية In part two, our Hamdi's friends, his deadly rivals and the enemies who posed as friends. It was 1977, and Ibrahim al Hamdi was in his third year as president of North Yemen. He aimed to modernize the country, but faced internal opposition. Some suspected army commander Ahmed al Hashmi of plotting against him. Nine months had passed since President Al Hamdi had met his southern counterpart. It was approaching the 14th of October, and the two leaders were due to meet in Aden for what many expected would be an important announcement about reunification of North and South Yemen. كانت السعودية بتضغط على الغشمي لا يروح الحمدي عدن. كان همهم أن لا يذهب الحمدي إلى عدن وأن لا يصل العمدي إلى عدن. الحمدي كان على وشك اتخاذ قرارات مهمة سوف تحدث تحولات كبيرة كبيرة داخل اليمن والمنطقة هو والرئيس سالم الربيع علي
According to now declassified U.S. State Department documents, Al-Khashmi invited Al-Hamdi to lunch at his home in Sana'a. It was billed as a celebration to mark the return to the capital of Yemen's prime minister, who'd been receiving medical treatment abroad. Al-Hamdi was late, and at 1.30 in the afternoon, Al-Khashmi called the president to remind him of the invitation and the importance of attending. One of the first to arrive at what became known as the last lunch was Abdullah Al Hamdi, a senior army officer and brother of the president. The host, Al Hashmi, had assembled a guest list that was a who's who of Yemen's leadership. Amongst the dignitaries was Ali Abdullah Saleh, commander of the Taiz military brigade and a future president. To find out more, Jamal al moleke from Al Jazeera Arabic went to Paris to meet with Al Hamdi's spokesman at the time. While the spokesman was not at the lunch, he did speak to a key eyewitness. According to the eyewitness, as the bodyguards waited outside, Al Hamdi was welcomed by Al Hashmi and Ali Abdullah Saleh, both Yemeni presidents in waiting. Al Hamdi's good fortune was about to run out. When I came to Ibrahim Al Hamdi, I was told that Abdullah Hamdi had been transferred to him. I stood by Abdullah Hamdi, considering that there were some of the weapons or the weapons of the military forces. And he was going to be a part of it. Abdullah Al Hashmi was the leader of the Arkan. The day that he said, أن الغشمي اتصل بعبد الله الحمدي قبل قصد إبراهيم وأنه خلاص جيب الورق وتعال أنا بو بوقع لك على هذه الطلبات فاستدرج ويقال ثم صفيته قبل أن يصب إبراهيم بدأوا يعني يقربوا غدا للضيوف دخل على عبد الله صالح جاء على عبد الله صالح من مدخل البيت من الجهة الداخل رأى ذا وجاء وهمس بأذن إبراهيم الحمدي مش عارف إيش كلموا كلمتين وقاموا على أساس إنه بيدخلوا داخل فقال له عبد العزيز عبد الغني ولا الضيوف ولا الجنيد وغيره إنه أخ إبراهيم بنتقدم مع بعض هني قال لا معلش يعني نحن العسكريين في لنا كلام خاص فينا يعني ما نشيش ندوشكم فيه يعني ودخل على عبد الله صالح عامل يده على ظهر ابراهيم الحمدي ودخلوا الاثنين داخل الى هنا روايه الشهد العال عندنا انقطعت ما الذي جرى داخل بعد ذلك احنا حتى الان احناش عارفين انه في حصل اغتيال The point where Al Hamdi walks through the door is where the account gets murky where facts give way to theory and speculation it's a story with different endings, depending on the storyteller. The guests were expecting to bid Al Hamdi farewell, given that the president was due to fly to Aden for all important talks with his southern counterpart the next day. As minutes turned to hours, Al Hamdi's bodyguards became increasingly concerned. <laughs> دخلهم فوق الخبرة حق إبراهيم ساعة ثلاثة ونص قالوا لهم قوموا روحوا لكم الرئيس وأخوك خرجوا من الباب الخلفي جلسوا يبحثوا من هذه الساعة ل... لساعة ستة جمعنا بعض الفرق قد إحنا هوشلية كان في معنا ثنتين مدرعات 
سته في سته وصلنا لا باب القياده المدرب عبد التفلبا والتفاهم قربت نقد في ناس شاح ومحاضرات اللي في القياده واحنا اللي خارج كان طلع علي قدينه وكان ضابط مسؤول عن عن القياده شاف المغرب يا على السلطان اصحاب الافراد الرئيس اختي The president's bodyguards were left wondering how Al Hamdi could have been assassinated while in the company of his most trusted political allies. What should have been a lunch celebration had become a crime scene. So what happened that afternoon, and who may have been responsible? Most of those present on that day have since died. Indeed, a number would themselves be murdered later. There are clues, however, to be found in the archives of Western embassies who closely followed events in Yemen in 1977. One American account, attributed to Al Khashmi, who would before the day's end assume the presidency, claimed that unidentified gunmen had shot Al Hamdi while in his car. Another, more lurid account, said that Al Hamdi and his brother had rented a small house, a hideaway, that they had picked up two French girls. and that somehow both brothers had been murdered not only had the president been killed but it appeared that his character was also under assassination البيت التي وجدوا فيها الفتاتين واللي تم فيها الاغتيال وعقد الايجار كان ما بين اداره العلاقات العامه للقوات المسلحه وما بين المالك البيت And what of the French connection, the two women who were said to have been with the Al Hamdi brothers? Not only did they exist, but they were indeed murdered in Yemen around the same time as President Al Hamdi. Their names were Veronique Troy and Françoise Scrivano. Veronique Troy had a glamorous lifestyle, enjoying the company of film directors in France's glitzy Riviera. To some, she was a high-class call girl. To others. She was a spy. Tous les éléments dans cette enquête, je les ai eus donc en, en investiguant auprès des services de police qui euh, qui dirigeaient l'enquête, d'une part, et par le père de Veronique III, qui voulait absolument savoir pourquoi sa fille était morte. Je me suis posé la question pourquoi Veronique III et Francesca étaient partis au Yémen et ont été assassinés. Pour quelle raison alors que n'avait rien à voir avec le Yémen? One of my very good Yemeni friends, Mohammed Shami, was a uh, a diplomat, and uh, he was and a friend of his were in the uh, embassy in Paris. Mohammed Shami was the person who recruited uh, these two prostitutes. And had them, and, and and sent them to Yemen. And I remember uh, Muhammad Shami. He also cried when he told me that story. He was a true believer in Ibrahim Al Hamdi and the role that Al Hamdi uh, was going to hopefully play in the development of of Yemen. So Muhammad Shami just felt terrible that he had been the person who had recruited these two prostitutes. Prostitutes who, who were then killed and thrown into a room uh, with the Al Hamdi brothers in order to bring shame and, and um, disrespect, disrespect uh, upon the Al Hamdi brothers. When I started to do my investigation, justement, on the murder of Al Hamdi and his two women. J'ai pensé qu'il fallait que je que je que je questionne des personnes qui étaient particulièrement euh, euh, au courant de des affaires yéménites à l'époque. Et donc j'ai j'ai notamment euh, euh, interrogé euh, Monsieur Abdallah Lasnaj, euh, qui était ministre des Affaires étrangères et qui que j'ai vu en exil lorsqu'il était en exil à Londres avant son décès donc dans les années 2000 et qui m'a raconté justement euh, comment en fait euh, ces deux femmes avaient été prises en charge par l'ambassade du Yémen à Paris notamment pour aussi pour leur transport 
à l'aéroport, euh, et quelles étaient les personnes qui avaient été chargées de cette mission-là, euh, comment ils, ils étaient partis en fait sur un vol d'Ethiopian Airlines qui allait jusqu'à Addis Abeba en escale jusqu'à Sanaa ensuite. Is it possible to ever find out what happened that day? Why was Al Hamdi murdered and who benefited from his assassination? There are several theories, though hard facts are in short supply. Thirbat Ahmed Al Ghashmi, by Ali Abdullah Saleh, is a strong, powerful, and strong man. So Ali Abdullah Saleh came out from Lwa Taiz and was found dead in the night of the assassination. They say that Al Ghashmi is a little bit slow, so he was killed by Ali Abdullah Saleh. أول ما باجر بال بالقتل يعني هذا يحكى طبعا لكن حقيقة هما هو القتلة يعني أحمد الغشمي علي عبد الله الصالح. Also in the list of suspects were tribal enemies opposed to Al Hamdi's erosion of their power. Others suspected the hand of Saudi Arabia. صالح الملحق العسكري الملحق العسكري صالح لوديان كان مشارك بالتخطيط والتنفيذ. كان نوع الملحق العسكري كان نوع مضاف معنا. Well, I think that the Saudis decided to get rid of Hamdi simply because they saw him as getting too strong and um, undercutting their influence in Yemen, uh, able to counter their traditional way of dealing with tribes. Two weeks after the murder, Saudi Arabia issued an official statement categorically denying any involvement in Al Hamdi's assassination. The denial came after claims within Yemen, including by a number of foreign diplomats, that individual Saudis may have been involved in the assassination, albeit indirectly. Their suspicion was that those who benefited most from the crime had links to Saudi Arabia. The widespread view, what I heard from Yemeni uh, contacts, friends, in private, of course, was that these assassina the assassination of Hamdi was, um, was a Saudi run operation using Yemenis who were in their pay or um, people they thought would do their beckoning. Among those was Kashmi and certainly Ali Abdullah Saleh. Ali Abdullah Saleh was a colonel in Taiz. No one was ever charged with the murder. Neither Al Hashmi nor Saleh ever admitted any part in the death of Al Hamdi. Al Hashmi died just a few months afterwards. As for Ali Abdullah Saleh, he became president in 1978 and would later point the finger of blame at Saudi Arabia. لا يمكن أي طرف خارجي أن يقوم باغتيال رئيس دولة بدون ما تكون اليد الداخلية حاضرة فيه واليد الداخلية هي أحمد الغشمي وعلي عبد الله صالح. The Al Jazeera Arabic examination of the death of Ibrahim Al Hamdi has uncovered numerous documents and heard testimony from many who were in Yemen in the 1970s. These include the deputy ambassador at the U.S. mission in Yemen, who arrived in Sanaa two months after the murder of Al Hamdi. Key diplomatic cables from the time have been released. Others remain under lock and key. The reasons why the government might not declassify, which is the, is the word, mm -hmm. to make it public would be perhaps there are intelligence sources, meaning there are quotes or connections with individuals who are still alive, who might be compromised by what's in the message. Uh, it could be American intelligence people, but it could be Yemeni uh, political figures. That would be one reason why you might not do it. The second might be that there is something in the message which would undermine our relationship and interest with another country. 
Another cable, this time declassified from British diplomats in Saudi Arabia in 1977, sheds further details on the denial of Saudi involvement. It was in response to news agency reports in the region and to a bulletin on Radio Moscow. The statement added that Saudi Arabia would stand by those they refer to as their brothers in Yemen, recognizing the close ties between al-Hamdi and Saudi Arabia. Breaking the news to the Yemeni people that their president had been killed was a task that fell to al-Hamdi's official spokesman. He was summoned to the office of al-Hashmi, the recently installed president, and asked to draft a statement. The result was an announcement that was high on emotion and low on detail. <laughs> قلت له ايش في حصلت محاوله انقلاب فشلت نجحت قال لا قلني ما هو شيء انقلاب قال لا ما هو لا قال لا كذا حادث قال هو كان الاخ ابراهيم هو اخوه يعني في مكان وحصل حادث وراحوا الاثنين فقعدنا نكتب هذا هو فكان عمل فقره هذا يقول لي لا هذه خففها هذه عليها هذه وطيها هذه قلت له لا شوف صياغة البيانات في حدث مثل هذا لا تكون بهذا الأسلوب ولكن أما أن تكتب المسودة أنت وأنا أراجع أو أكتب أنا المسودة وأنت تراجع المهم أذيع البيان بعد ما صغنا بعد تعديلات اللي عملوها أيها الشعب اليمني الكريم لقد تعودت في طريق حفاظك على حريتك واستقلالك وثورتك وجمهوريتك أن تشابه الأخطار والمحن بإيمان قوي وثبات لا يتزعزع إنه في هذا اليوم الأسود الكئيب في تاريخ شعبنا اليمني العظيم فضت أيد آثمة مجرمة خائنة لشعبها ووطنها على حياة قائد مسيرتنا الأخ المناضل المقدم إبراهيم محمد الحمدي. The reaction from the international community to the assassination was muted. There were regrets and sympathy was expressed, but little else. Ibrahim al-Khamdi had been murdered, and the world was moving on. We have learned with great sorrow the tragic death of the President of the Arab Republic of Yemen, His Excellency Mr. Ibrahim Mohamed al-Khamdi. بسم المجموعة العربية التي يعود لبلد شرف رئاستها هذا الشهر. أود أن أتقدم إلى وفد الجمهورية العربية اليمنية الشقيق وإلى الشعب اليمن البطل بأصدق عواطف العزاء والمواساة بمناسبة الحدث الأليم الذي أودى بحياة الفقيد المقدم إبراهيم محمد الحمدي. The host of what became known as the last lunch, Ahmed Al Ghashmi, assumed office and succeeded to the presidency. His tenure, however, was short-lived. Just eight months into his term, he too was assassinated, killed by a briefcase bomb allegedly carried by an envoy from South Yemen, though some dispute the true identity of his killer. The revolving door of Yemeni leadership brought in a new president, Abdul Karim Al Arashi. A month later, he was out of office. Enter Ali Abdullah Saleh, who consolidated his power base and later in 1990 would become president of a united Yemen. A political survivor, Ali Abdullah Saleh would remain in power through 33 turbulent years. His political career ended with his murder in 2017. 
But Hamdi's biggest goal, his major goal, was to turn Yemen into uh, the major regional player in politics in terms of Red Sea security and in terms of unifying North and South Yemen. It's easy to conjecture as to what Hamdi may have accomplished. Was he actually serious about uniting North and South? Uh, but none of this came to fruition because Hamdi uh, was killed before he was able to go down to Aden in October of 1977 and announce his plans. The Al-Hamdi years offered hope for many Yemenis. Here was a modernizing president with the stated aim of unifying the country. As for who killed him, there are suspects and theories, but no one will ever know. Researchers have examined documents, film and video without ever producing a smoking gun. The new president, Ahmed al-Khashmi, certainly benefited from the murder, and al-Hamdi had enemies, including some tribal leaders opposed to his reform agenda. As for Saudi Arabia, no direct evidence linking Riyadh to the plotters ever came to light. <laughs> The secrets of the assassination of Ibrahim al-Khamdi remain a mystery. Forty years on, there are few witnesses still alive, and his family is still seeking justice. Had he survived, Yemen might have steered a different path, with different outcomes. Cut short by murder, Ibrahim al-Khamdi's vision was unfulfilled.